In this sequence of videos, we're going to be covering Chapter 7, Section 4 of the 4th edition of Night. And the topic of this chapter is our ropes and pulleys. And the book usually uses the word strings. I use the word ropes. It's really going to be the same thing, and we'll talk about why. So the goal is to talk here about the properties of ideal ropes and ideal pulleys. Obviously, in the real world, they're not going to be ideal. But to simplify our calculations, we're going to make some assumptions about these objects that help us a lot. Um, later on, in, once we learn about rotation, we can make our pulleys a little more complicated. But if you want to deal with anything else, uh, more real-world ropes and pulleys, you quickly get to differential equations and things we just don't want to do in here. Now, by using ideal ropes and pulleys, we're going to be able to simplify problems by relating tension forces to each other in a very direct way. So everything we're using here is still using the idea of interacting objects and Newton's third law, but once again, this is uh, particularly an application to problem solving that we're focusing on here. So first, just to remind you, let's think about what tension is. And the reason we want to do this is because we're going to talk about what an ideal rope is or an ideal string and how tension works in that case. So once upon a time, when we were learning about forces and the normal force back in chapter five, the book introduced the, I'm trying to remember what it was called specifically, but ball and spring model, something like that. And the idea is to think of solid objects as being made up of tiny little spheres that are connected to one another via springs. And you understand that if you try to pull a spring apart, stretch it, you can, but it pulls back. Similarly, you can compress a spring, but it pushes back. So that's how we're going to think about materials. And if you've had a bit of chemistry, you might understand that this is a very simplified toy model, but it is a nice start to understand that when you push or pull on a material, it is pushing or pulling back. So let's think about our rope here, suspending a big heavy object. We say that there is tension in the entire rope. The reason for that is that the molecules at the very bottom are pulling on the molecules above, but these molecules pull back. So when we zoom in, we would say that if I think about this molecule being pulled down by the big old mass hanging from it, that that pulls on this one, which then pulls on that one, but eventually you get to the top and they're pulling back. So there's really tension throughout the entire rope. That's what's important here. And we'll talk about the fact that it's uniform. There isn't a, a change that you would make if we're going to talk about a non-ideal rope or a non-ideal uh, string. We're not going to focus on that right now. So the tension forces pull in both directions. It's as if the rope is trying to be stretched, right? That you're pulling on it, but the rope is also pulling back. So let's think through tension in two situations. And I like that this, uh, this example that the book has. And the idea is to think about two situations where you have a person pulling on a rope. For this situation, we don't even have to consider an ideal rope. So I haven't defined yet what makes an ideal rope. We don't have to worry about it yet. So in this situation, we have our person who is pulling with 100 newtons of force. So this is telling us about our force, and in both cases, our force is to the left. And because I love coordinate systems, we'll call right the positive x hat and up the positive y hat. So in one situation, the rope is ending at a wall. It is tied off at a wall. In the second situation, a second person is holding on to it, and this person is pulling now 100 newtons to the right. So we want to think about the tension in these two scenarios, the difference being in one case you have a wall, in the other case you have a second person. So this is where we want to think a little bit about forces, and we would want to think about free body diagrams. So if we're going to do that, the first step is to define what our object is. Our object is actually the rope. So when I make my free body diagram, that's what I'm going to draw, is actually for the rope. 
and we see that the person is pulling to the left at 100 newtons. Now, in this case, we're not going to worry about gravity and what the assumption we're going to make soon is that the rope itself actually doesn't have a mass. But right now, we're just going to kind of ignore gravity. And one of the reasons why that's OK is you don't see it sagging. If we had to worry about gravity, the rope itself would be sagging since it looks very horizontal. That tells you that we can effectively ignore what's happening in the y hat direction. So is the rope accelerating? I see that my rope is not accelerating. So what does that tell me about my net force? My net force must be equal to zero. But right now, with my free body diagram, I show one force to the left, negative x hat direction, 100 newtons. If I need my net force to be zero, that means that there must be an equal and opposite force to the right that is also 100 newtons. What is that coming from? This is the force of the wall on the rope, which I'll just abbreviate R. So that's the situation on the left, that we have a net force of zero. And we see that the wall must be pulling with 100 newtons of force, or else the rope would be accelerating. So now let's look at the second situation. Assuming that these people are stationary and that no one's accelerating either left or right, we can say that the rope, again, has an acceleration of zero. So again, I want to draw my free body diagram for it. And if I have an acceleration of zero, I have a net force equal to zero. Now, this is more obvious because my person on the left is still pulling with 100 newtons. My person on the right, we've now labeled, is pulling with 100 newtons. And that's this one. I keep trying to switch to green and it doesn't work. That one. OK. So in this case, it's very clear that these two forces balance, that your net force is zero, your rope does not accelerate. But in the first case, we said that the rope was not accelerating, so the net force must be zero. So from this, we infer that the wall is pulling on the rope with 100 newtons of force. So these two situations are actually equal from the rope's point of view, that even though in one case there's a person here and in the other case a wall, from the rope's point of view, it's being pulled on each side with 100 newtons. So we would say in this case that the tension in the rope is 100 newtons. To try to clarify the picture a little bit, I'm going to use the uh, free body diagrams. Well, these aren't quite free body diagrams. Uh, force sketches, if you will, from the book. So this was our first situation for the wall. And note that we have now these dashed lines, which you should immediately think Newton's third law pair. So the rope is pulling on the student. The rope is pulling the student forward. And we would normally call this tension. And the Newton's third law pair for that is that the rope pulls on the student, the student pulls on the rope. And this is what we call the 100 Newton pull. Now, before I had identified that the wall must be pulling on the rope, and that is because the rope pulls on the wall. So what's normally going to happen is that we would call this force a tension force, and we would call this force over here a tension force. And we see that they are both 100 newtons. And so even though their distances are different, we would say that the magnitudes are equal. And so both ends of the rope are pulling with the same tension. In the second scenario, we see that the rope is pulling on student one, student on the left. And again, Newton's third law pair, the student's pulling on the rope. And then for the student on the right, student pulls on the rope, rope pulls on the student. So again, you have these dashed lines representing Newton's third law pair. But again, you have tension that is equal in magnitude in both places. So we say that the tension is constant throughout the rope. It doesn't matter if you have just an inanimate object here, the wall or a person, that we would say that both sides of the rope are pulling with 100 newtons, and we use this equilibrium argument to get to this point. At the 
risk of this video getting a little long, I'm going to do one more example. So now I have blocks hanging under the force of gravity. So we would say that gravity, the acceleration due to gravity, is still down. I'm going to define my coordinate system such that I can say that I have g in the negative y direction. Now I'm not actually talking about acceleration in this problem, I'm just reminding you that hey, gravity exists. So what we would want to do in this case is draw a free body diagram for each of these blocks. So if I take my block on the left first, I see that I have the force of gravity down, and I'm going to call that 1, and that's going to equal m which is 50 kilograms times g in the negative y hat direction. Now in this case the block is stationary and in actually in both cases these are stationary. There's no acceleration happening. We can definitely say that. And up here is then going to be t1 and since my block has a net force of zero, then this must actually be equal in magnitude t1 to my gravitational force down. So that's pretty simple. Now we have to consider this. So I have two free body diagrams here, one on the left, one on the right, and I have this Fg2 which is also equal going in this case to 50 kilograms times, sorry for running out of space, negative y hat, and my second block has actually the same force down. Because they have the same mass, they're going to have those same forces down. Now there's a tension force up. Pretend that is straight up. Now because this is one rope, and this is something I'm going to come to at the end, is interpreting these pictures. So this is a pulley here, so this is its axis, it can rotate around it. This rope continues over and through. So there is one rope here. So because of this, whatever tension I have here, I have here, 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 so on. Same tension all the way through. So these tensions must be equal to each other in magnitude. You can see that they both pull up, so they're literally the same vector since they have the same direction and magnitude. So if neither of these blocks are accelerating, this makes perfect sense. If one of these blocks was accelerating down, the other would have to accelerate up, and that wouldn't make sense because if they have the same forces down and the same forces up, then for both of these, F net must equal zero. So nothing is accelerating, F net equals zero, so my tension up, again, equals the force of gravity down. So for both of these, the magnitude of tension where this is either of the tension force is just going to equal 50 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared from gravity. So even though there are two blocks here, they're attached to the same rope. You would only draw your free body diagram for one block, and you would see therefore that that tension, if that block is not accelerating, must equal that force of gravity. So this is a pretty important situation to think through. We'll talk a little more about it later on when we talk more about pulleys.